there's so many solutions on the market that companies are getting overwhelmed with how many solutions there are in their customer experience or in their customer journey. Uh, meaning that you have all these little touch points and how do you bring it all together? What you want is a platform that orchestrates this all for you. This is exactly what Tap does. <laughs> And welcome to this episode of TP AI Talks. I'm Aaron Broker, Vice President of Marketing at TP. And today we're going to talk about the TP AI Fab framework. So joining me is um, Danny Kievenhoven. So Danny, what is TP AI Fab? Thank you. Well, TP AI Fab is our foundational AI backbone, which is obviously a lot of words, uh, but what does it mean? Uh, so the, the day and age where we're living in today, we are trying to shift to something we call orchestrated intelligence, which we can we can explain a bit later. Uh, later. And FAT is basically how we're going to arrange that uh, that orchestrated intelligence. So uh, FAT is you know obviously people recognize it for fabulous, which is also being fabulous. But basically, what FAB is, it's uh, our foundation layer uh, layers, which is we have our foundation layer, mm -hmm. we have our AI orchestration layer, and we have our blueprint layer. And what's uh, amazing about it and what's very new about it is that it allows us to orchestrate outcomes. So uh, in this day of age, you see a lot of AI products coming about, AI so solutions. But the downside of these, there are all point solutions. Uh, so it can help you solve uh, some specific issue. Uh, but what you want is to have a one-stop shop where you can enter and we can solve everything around those different layers. Uh, so um, what do we mean without, with orchestrating outcomes? So we have a lot of clients today that have AI and Ray, right? It's, it's no longer uh, experimentation. It's, you know, it's, it's board level discussions. Uh, and we've, I think we're getting to a time where people are not longer asking for a chatbot, right? They, they come to us saying, uh, TP, can you help us to get, uh, uh, increase our conversion rates or increase our quality or help us lower our costs? And, and these are the outcomes that we are trying to orchestrate and get to the, the point where our clients are looking for. Does that paint a picture? It does. Okay, so you look at the outcome that the client wants and you engineer the solution to deliver just that outcome. Exactly, exactly. Because uh, in the end, there's a lot of solutions in the market today that can bring you from A to B. Mm -hmm. uh, but just getting to B is no longer uh, uh, good enough, right? So. Uh, sometimes you have to get different routes. So the way how I always have looked at TP and our clients is that we are basically the chameleon of solutions, right? We have all these different clients, all these different business objectives. Uh, and although we have solutions, we have to alter them to get to the outcome that they prefer. So we have clients that are very cost oriented. So that means that we can take a different route for those type of costs. Then we have clients that said, we are mainly looking at uh, high quality. So we are a quality player, quality is our different shader. Uh, so we are less interested in cost, although you know, everyone's interested in cost. Uh, they want to have it in an effective cost, but they want to have that quality. And we can con uh, configure our system that makes sure that we can get that outcome that you as a business are looking for. And every industry is different too. So you factor that in as well, I'm sure. Exactly. Well, and that's where we have the, uh, the the blueprint layer. So what we're using in the blueprint layer is what we call our verticalized blueprints. So uh, the benefit that he brings brings is four decades of deep vertical experience. So we know what f uh, fraud is in banking. We know what compliance is in healthcare. We know uh, where are the uh, to where are these critical points in the customer journey in retail. Uh, and uh, what we do in the vertical blueprint is we take proven case solutions uh, and build them into a, a, a blueprint that we can basically recycle, which means that we don't have to solve the problem each time for every client in the same vertical. We can restack it and then basically adjust it to the context of that specific client. Uh, so we are ready to go, which gives us scalability. But I think in this day of age, it gives us speed. And then a lot of our clients that are looking for AI solutions, they don't want to go to an implementation that takes three to six months. There, right? It's usually how it goes is they want it and they want it not. Right. Right. And after four decades, you know, we've got, you know, countless numbers of best practices that have been proven with other clients of the same industry or the same um, solution, you know, outcome desire. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, from the experience that we have, 
uh, we basically built this pre-configured packages. And those are the packages that we then use inside of their customer journey uh, or their patient journey or their, their, their citizen journey. So in our vertical life solution, we basically look at the full stack of the process. And then within those process, we have those pre-configured solutions uh, that we can scale up and spin up for them uh, to create the value that they're looking for. Right. And the flip side of that is, you know, what challenges would a company face if they're trying to implement AI without this type of very structured uh, framework? That's a very good question. So I think what we've seen in the last, I would say, five to eight years is that uh, there's so many solutions on the market that mm -hmm. companies are getting overwhelmed with how many solutions there are in their customer experience or in their customer journey, uh, meaning that you have all these little touch points and how do you bring it all together, right? So mm -hmm. Uh, you wanna, uh, so you can deploy a chatbot, but a chatbot does just one specific thing. Uh, if you want to have a back office process, the chatbot will not fix that for you. So that means that you have another solution, perhaps for that one, and then you have another one, and then you have another one. And how do you all integrate all of these solutions into each other? What you want is a platform that orchestrates this all for you. This is exactly what Tap does. So it basically, overcomes the typical kind of pitfalls of doing these like really narrow kind of point solutions because it's such a more holistic approach. Exactly, exactly. Because uh, there's a lot of testing and experimentation uh, that you have to do, uh, the implementation time of each set solution. Uh, and what you see is that sometimes these solutions within the client have different stakeholders. So one is doing one thing, the other one's doing another thing. Uh, and, and that's why you're not getting out the most value out of that complete solution. So let me give you an example. Great. Um, Let's see, we have a, a vertical with a process that basically touches front, middle, and back office. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm sure that in the market, there's probably a solution to do the, the front office part, let's say chatbots or uh, voice AI. Uh, and there's something in the back end, which could be an automation solution. But what you see in such a process that it still has to go, you know, perhaps the request comes in into the front office, then basically that gets registered and then it goes into the system and then it has to go to the back office and someone's working on that one. And then perhaps it comes back to the front office because we have to do a customer validation. That process might take 30 days. So now inside FAP, where we have it as a one-stop shop, we can get all those processes aligned and that 30 days might be 15 days or 10 days or five days. Uh, and if there's a revenue generating starting point for a new client onboarding, that means that you can start billing that client 15 days earlier. So that creates a lot of value and also a lot of convenience for the customer because it's quicker, it's more reliable, uh, and it's also very personal. So tell me a little bit about the foundation layer. So basically, if you think about foundation, uh, this is, well, like I said, it's the fundamental. So what we do there is uh, this is where our data strategy comes together. So this is where we prep the data to make sure it's aligned for the AI, but this is also a lot of our procedures sit there. So we have our AI ops there. We have our LMs ops there. We have our fin ops there. Um, and I like to emphasize the fin ops part because I think that's getting overlooked. Uh, and if, if, if I look at what the, the day age today is, that you will see a lot of consumption of AI tokens and people are still doing a lot of experimentation. So they're not actually looking at the cost. But if you scale it at a size that I think the world is expecting, um, cost the of becoming a very big factor. So you want to make sure that you have a fin ops running to making sure thing, hey, yes, I can see the revenue or the, or the benefit that it's coming from, but what about the cost? And uh, I even saw a Gartner prediction that I think it's 2028, that 50% of the businesses that are using AI will scale down their consumption because they're, they're, the costs are getting out of control. Uh, so for fin ops, there's a very important part there, uh, but this is also, uh, it, it's basically our cloud tool chest, right? So this is where we pick up our LMs and that can be an out-of-the-box LM. It could be one of our homegrown models, uh, fine-tuned models or uh, domain-specific language models. Uh, and obviously it's it's everything around cloud. So what the foundation layer gives us is one, scalability because of the cloud capabilities, but also this is where we set our security uh, procedures. So we have uh, well, everything around security, so encryption, uh, data lineage, but also, for instance, uh, our ethical AI and responsible AI procedures sits in this foundation layer. Got it. We're talking about scaling AI up and down. The big question these days is how do you balance that with the human side? Yeah. How would you, how would you respond to that? Well, obviously we have a lot of those, I get a lot of questions around AI and human. And I think where the wall is evolving is it, it has to become lesser of a discussion of where it sits, right? I think the easy answer to that question is 
humans are best in anything around emotions, right? So if you look at it, I would say the traditional way of how AI humans interact is if an interaction is heavily emotionally loaded uh, or very complex, you, you, you route it to a human, right? This is where humans excel in, right? If it's a, an, an something about your medical condition or it could be something about fraud or it could be a very complex customer interaction, this is where the humans shine. Uh, but there's much more to look at it from an equation. Again, like I said, uh, what we do is we orchestrate outcomes. So let's say there's a, an interaction coming in uh, and uh, for a, a, cost of, a, a very cost efficient client where cost is the most important driver, we might set the threshold for AI a bit lower because we know that if we would run it through AI, that's probably the most cost effective solution. However, the chance of success might be lesser, uh, but uh, for a cost effective uh, client, we would route it to the AI anyway at that point to see if there's a first fix there. And obviously, if that wouldn't help, we would hand over to a human expert that can solve it. And so that will make your uh, costs low, lower. However, it, the, your quality might suffer for it because for the customer, it, it will do an attempt with AI first and still it has to hand over, which your customer journey also always suffer a bit. Well, for exactly the same intent and a client that's more focused around quality, we probably would set the threshold even higher and then therefore that specific intent would go to a human expert and stuff to, a, to AI. Right. It was called those the high stakes situations where, you know, someone really wants the reassurance from another human. Exactly. Like, oh, I always make a very easy question, anything around uh, money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if someone takes money for you and say, hey, you took my money, you don't want to talk to me. You want to speak to you, right? You want to get reassured. Uh, anything around uh, time, uh, I always give a good example. It's like you missed your flight, right? So mm -hmm. time is probably one of the most valuable assets that we have these days. So again, you want to get that solved as quick as possible. And usually you want to get reassured. And if anything about your experience, so if you feel that you're, you're not getting the best out of experience out of it, that's where we also want to speak to you. And, and we do see uh, in our statistics as well that there's still a lot of people that don't even listen out to, uh, the, to the AI, right? They said, uh, oh, uh, can I speak to a human, please? Or can I speak to a person? And, and therefore, we, we hand over to that. So that's also uh, where the customer still has a voice in, do you want to speak to a human or not? We've all done that, I know. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> We've all been there. Um, so where has the model, the FAB model, shown demonstrative results? And can you share any use cases or examples? Yeah, yeah. So, so st we're still building the model into the point where we want to get it. And, and there's a very good long-term vision where I said, at some point, I want to be able to be in full control. So mm -hmm. I want to be at the stage where if a customer says, uh, I want to increase my NPS with four points, that I can, I know what to do to configure to get exactly those four points. That's where we want to go to. I would say where we see the most success now is more on the low hanging fruits. So I think we've been very successful with expert augmentation. So uh, where AI is supporting uh, the human. Uh, so these are things where we uh, have AI helping the experts find the answer quicker or help the experts collect the data much quicker because the AI is collecting the data. So it's just there uh, when the expert needs it. Uh, and it has so many benefits because you see a reduction in uh, handle time, which is usually a reduction in costs. Uh, we see an increase in first time resolution, meaning that we don't have, we see less repetitive traffic. Uh, but there's also effects there at, uh, where people overlock easily. And that's for instance, that we make our low tenured experts more successful from day one, which means that well, everyone goes to their job to be more successful and more expert, but that means that they get more excitement and more enjoyment out of their work. And therefore we see a a reduction of uh, attrition on project where we have these type of options. Uh, so I would say expert augmentation is probably one of the things that we see the most successful right now, uh, up to 30% reduction in time uh, in some cases. And I love it eliminates a lot of the manual work of summarizing calls afterwards and things that the, that the TP experts just don't enjoy because it's mundane. Exactly. So. Exactly. Also, I would say the age of RPA, we had to the slogan, uh, remove the robot from the human, right? All the, that repetitive work where um, I would say if you're low tenured, it's still acceptable, but especially the more tenured people, they don't want to do all that repetitive. They know what they, they like more, the challenges out of the job because that gives them more fulfillment. Exactly. So, so, and again, that that's something I would say that repetitive work is always a thing that we would strive to remove. Uh, but I think we're now more and more with FAB moving into, I would say my new mantra, which is, uh, AI makes humans better in the moment and humans make AI better over time. 
because we see new tasks emerging where uh, we use our people in their downtime to actually coach and QA the AI so we can actually have a continuous feedback loop and continuous improvement loop on our AI, making sure that it can still do, can always deliver the AI and the quality that our clients are expecting from us. And that's because of our people. They are the ones that actually train the AI, making sure that we can live up to that standard. Right, because you've said in the past that you know, if, if a question or inquiry comes in and the AI does not know how to handle it, it'll run it to the person, but then that gets added to their knowledge base so they know how to handle that the next time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I've developed something what I call the expert contribu uh, contribution framework, which I can basically, it's four quadrants where, you, where I can segregate something in, in the moment and something that's uh, out, outside of the live interaction. So in the moment, it's the one that we discussed earlier on, where you say if it's high emotionally or complex, that's what you want to do. That's the one that we've traditionally been seeing over the last few years. So second is exploratory work. So that's the point that you're, you're mentioning, right? Because uh, where I see where a lot of tech players in the market don't have a proper solution for is that the, the market, the world that we live in is very dynamic. So new intents emerge, new products, new processes. Uh, and if AI cannot establish that intent, it, it doesn't have an answer. So what do you do there? If the threshold is too low, it will say, hey, I'm not sure if this intent is something that I know. So it will hand over to a human. So that's basically just like the same as for the complex work. However, we push a task with that as well, that the human actually labels that intent. So we know, it, is it something that the AI actually had to pick up, but it just didn't do a, a good job there? Or is it actually something new that we have to learn and train the AI? So that's what the exploratory work for that. So inside the expert contribution framework, we also have two tasks, uh, which is new, which is more than what I meant, mentioned before, where AI makes, uh, human makes AI better over time. Mm -hmm. And it, that's where we either do the QA work, and it depends a bit on which technology we use. So if we're using more uh, basic la large language model, it means that you actually have to do some QA work there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and that's just like if a human would do a human QA work, uh, or if we're using any uh, uh, small language model or fine tuned model, it's more like a data annotation like we do with TP.AI data services. Well, thank you, Danny, for all of your insights, and we appreciate your time. Thank you for having me on. Um, and thanks to all of you for watching, and uh, keep an eye out for the next episode of our TP AI Talks. Take care.